So thank you to everybody at the panel. To give, to give a little more background for people in the audience, most of the, um, many of the papers being presented today are, are being considered for a book project. Um, but the book project itself is very young, so these are very um, preliminary ideas that are being presented. Some of them are in very early drafts. Some of them exist just in this kind of presentation PowerPoint. So, so in addition to your um, reflections and comments about the themes generally, I think all of the, the speakers would welcome um, points you might like to read further about, critical comments, etc. So we just have about 10 minutes or so in this discussion, but then we do have a break, and I think I would really like to take this break so that you have the opportunity to individually um, consult the various authors. So I, I think how I'll run this is I will give a few reflections of my own on each of the papers and then open it up um, to comments, which will take all the comments, and then we'll try to save about you know three to four minutes for each of the speakers to respond to anything you want. Um, or you're welcome to just take it in and comment to people in the break or, or um, and continue to reflect on it. Um, <clears throat> so many of my comments are in the nature of, you know, if you continue to flush this idea out in a, in a paper, um, things that might, might be helpful to look at. Um, so I'll start with Duncan. Duncan, I, I mean, I think you're, you're towards the end of your paper, and this is a very fresh idea. You mentioned you wrote it primarily on the plane. <laughs> um, but how, you know, how do we identify the factors in which, in which human rights discourse works and, and where it does not? So you start to allude that maybe there's a community individual or the community rights kind of less hospitable to human rights discourse where things that we can frame in an individual rights mechanism may be more. Um, that, I think there's always a nagging question about whether the negative rights are more powerful than the positive rights. Does that become a factor? So we're, when we're asking affirmatively for the state to adopt a new regulatory policy, is that a less effective forum for um, discourse than when we're challenging a positively that negative, uh, negatively affects someone's current enjoyment? Um, the Navarapine case is a positive case, but it can almost be it can be framed in that negative aspect as well. I mean, the drug was offered for free, the government made an affirmative decision to not implement it, and I think that jerked on the court's kind of negative rights um, part. In addition, that last phrase, you know, human rights are fundamental or IP rights are instrumental. Um, you can flip that so easily in modern discourse as well, where human rights are really instrumental. I mean, they, they are strategically situated. They exist where people use them. Um, and they don't exist where people don't use them. Where the IP rights almost seem fundamental, they seem ever present, they exist even where people are not asserting them. Um, so the extent to which we kind of tease that out is to human rights, are human rights absence from some forums just because human agency is absent in those same forums or human adoption of this. Um, for Surrey, um, the, the analysis of kind of you know which aspects of these of these private uh, privately applicable human rights um, should be framed as a must versus a should, which I think is a very important and provocative question. Um, this whole field, to me, and, and and I think there's a need to to further unpack this field. And I don't know if this is if this is your role or not. But in in the grand story about how the the shift of international law to the vertical of regulating the relationship between the state and the individual is fairly recent. The shift between international law regulating individuals directly is not just recent, it's fairly non-existent. Right? There's a whole debate about whether that exists at all and whether it should exist. I mean, I don't, I don't see enough grappling in this field about do we want international law to directly regulate the individual? And you. I think you engage that on many levels of saying, shouldn't, isn't this an area, you know, you talk about pricing, isn't this an area where the government should state the rules? And you shouldn't expect human rights to regulate the pharmaceutical companies directly. And, and I think you could even, you know, do you have a, a launching, a starting point where you say, yes, human rights should regulate, but then here's my principal distinction for where I think the state should step in and where it shouldn't. Um, which, is a huge morass, and I have no answers. Um, for, for Andre, you're, um, you were you were engaging, you know, in the in the issue of the the concept of essential drugs, and and where should we um, 
find the human rights duties and tease them out a little bit, as, as, you, as you remark, it, it traces back to the, the concept of a core in, in general comment number 17. I've always been troubled with that part of the general comment. Should we really be talking about essential drugs or should we be talking about needed drugs? I feel like the concept of essential drugs plays <laughs> into the essential drug list and becomes a defensive posture of the pharmaceutical industry of saying, well, yeah, it's not on the essential drugs list, we don't have to do anything about it. Um, getting over, you know, there's very few patented drugs on the essential drugs list, as you know, and, and part of your moves is to, is to say that there should be a duty, or at least there I thought the should versus must was a little bit more unclear in your presentation, but you know, the, the duty of, of states to, to come up with their own essential drug lists and, and include a fuller range on that. Um, but I guess my question is, you know, should, should we be continuing to engage in that essential drugs discourse, or should we talk about a broader frames of of needed drugs or something. And that's a very strategic, just is is the essential drugs list, the WHO essential drugs is hampering our, our um, creativity in some respects. Um, and and Ellen, I, I, this is, uh, to some extent, extent, relates back to Duncan as well, but but I, I'm most attracted to the very last part of the presentation of kind of, of thinking about is there a human rights strategy, possibly in combination with other fields like competition law that you mentioned, that creates an enforceable duty to open license drugs, then for which the patent pool becomes an obvious target. You know, so you have the means of, you know, the argument can go something like whether it's through competition law or competition law plus intellectual, uh, plus human rights law, which is one I particularly like, using human rights law as an interpretive norm within the competition law discourse to say there is a medicine, if you don't license it, it won't be available on reasonable commercial terms in which we can upscale. Um, therefore, looking through essential facilities doctrines or refusal to license, refusal to deal doctrines, you meet all the elements. It's feasible for you to license. Consumer welfare will be maximized if you did. You can make your royalties and get a, a reasonable payment through that licensing structure. And there's a patent pool. There's even a vehicle for you to do it, and therefore you must. You know, it's kind of the type of argument that, that advocates were using in South Africa in a competition case. And, and it would be interesting to continue to lay out that argument in a way that people could kind of grab on it and run with it, you know, as we talk about strategy tomorrow, um, that really lays that out as a, as a doctrinal space.